What's going on, guys? Welcome to another episode of Bro History. It's Henry Zamoda and Danny Abdeljabar. What is up, my friend? How are you? Chilling, man. As per usual, uh, I do want to get some stuff out of the way real fast, just in the beginning of this very episode, especially for you folks that are watching us live here on YouTube. Um, I uh, heard through the grapevine, i.e. the YouTube comments, that uh, some of the volume levels were a bit low. Um, I want to give you a heads up that like we do this kind of on purpose. Uh, we have some like background hiss that we still have to get rid of that we usually clean up and post. That doesn't make its way into the audio podcast, um, but uh, as a way to placate you guys, uh, we've tried our best to boost the levels of the uh, of the live stream, uh, which shouldn't affect our podcast here. Um, but uh, if you're watching online, uh, please let us know if this sounds any better uh, and if the background hiss is like too much for you. It's something I can't clean up in, in like live streams, um, but you know, if it doesn't bother you then and you prefer to just hear our beautiful voices much louder than they usually are, then we'll keep going with that. Yeah, I mean, if it's an issue, you can always just listen on um, iTunes or Spotify or whatever podcast network. That's what most people listen to us on. But um, all right, now that we got that got that out of the way, um, how is everything? Good, man. Good. Uh, I've, I think doing the uh, research for this has been pretty fun because you can dive into a whole lot of rabbit holes. I think you know um, the invasion of Iraq kind of unearths a lot of a lot of things. What, what was your experience of of um, you know doing the research here? I mean, I, I've been looking into this for a, a long time now, and it's easy to get stuck in the different nuances of, of uh, the invasion of Iraq, uh, especially since there's been such a long history on it. But what what did you discover? Well, uh, I discovered that my running gag that the deeper you go into any of these history topics, uh, the farther you go into, you know, like alien astronaut theory, <laughs> ancient astronaut theory, evidently... Uh, I was doing some some work on this, and I stumbled across a, a video that had David Icke on it, who's a proponent of like lizard people. <laughs> so apparently, everything, all all of what we're going to talk about today, evidently stems from lizard people. So, just giving you guys a heads up that that's what I learned. <laughs> I don't think David Icke is that far. I don't think David Icke actually means lizard people. No, 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 no. He means actual reptilian he means actual lizard, li li people. lizard people. Yes. And I watched this like two hour stupid documentary. Uh, it was about, it starts, like it caught me because it was Donald Rumsfeld talking about how they lost like $2.3 trillion of Pentagon budget. And it was like, you know, where could this have gone? And I'm like, huh, okay, I'm interested. Like, tell me where, where did the money go, right? And then suddenly it takes a hard, like, I don't know if it's left or a right turn, but it just turns really hard. And it's like lizard people are, you know, infiltrating the top echelons of our world governments and and they're causing us to do like crazy human sacrifices and pedophilia and i'm like oh so this is where QAnon gets it and i'm like okay i get it okay <laughs> i still I watched david, that that was hilarious i think david i he purposely sabotages himself <laughs> yeah yeah he does i think some of these crazy conspiracy theorists they just they'll be talking about something that may be hold water and then they'll just they'll they'll toss kookadoo nonsense on it <laughs> just to discredit themselves so they're not taken seriously yeah like one thing that's that, a theory of mine one thing that really caught me off guard was like they were like talking about the ancient history of like of uh you know how the lizard people and like the elongated skull people uh were you know in power and shit and they were like they said this one thing about like in ancient egypt like thousands of years ago before, uh, during the book burning of Alexandria that they, they stole, they took all of the good books and they put it in the Vatican. And I'm like, wait, the Vatican didn't exist then during the ancient Egypt times. Or am I wrong about that? <laughs> right? Like no, the, the Vatican did not exist. The, the, book, bur the book burning <laughs> of the book burning of like the burning of Alexandria happened like thousands of years before, right? Well, the burning the burning of Alexandria happened a couple of times. It's, it's like a okay. It's like a it's a it's a very it's, like, it's a meme uh, misinterpreted. <laughs> it's, it's a misinterpreted part of history that is used um, as political sloganeering, mm -hmm. or in, in some cases, just kind of racist. Uh, 
pejoratives. Right. So people will blame different religions for the burning of that book, for, I mean, for, for the burning of uh, the Library of Alexandria. Right. So you'll hear a lot of like hard wing, <sighs> right, like hardcore right wingers be like, it was the radical Muslims that burnt the that library down i mean none of this Me- holds water to the lizard people though <laughs> well, meanwhile the, the 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 library of alexandria was burned down a couple of times but yeah. it was most likely burnt down by the eastern europeans not I'm that eastern europeans the eastern uh roman empire the byzantine mm-hmm. empire yeah uh, that seems to be the most evidence because they slaughtered a lot of people in alexandria including all the jews and all the all the pagans they just massacred everyone and there was like kind of a, a orgy of violence during that during that sacking. So um, I think that I think most historians agree that it was most likely the Eastern uh, the Eastern Roman Empire who did it. But it was the lizard right, people, not, dude. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't the lizard people. It wasn't the lizard people, or maybe it was. Um, but yeah, I think uh, QAnon that sort of stuff is. I think it's just fun fan fiction. It sounds like that's what it is, to be honest. It's, it sounds like, like like a rewrite of, of current events, you know? Like if you wanted to make like a more interesting like science fiction sitcom about this. <laughs> yeah, it's like fun fiction. It's, it's fan fiction of current events. I wish I knew how to find it. Because I haven't, I, I have zero clue where to find QAnon. I always, whenever I search for it, I can never find it. Um, so someone's got to direct, someone's <laughs> got to direct me to the link where I can read this stuff. You got to go on sounds, 4chan. That's where it exists. Oh, I don't go on that shit. Yeah. I don't do 4chan or Reddit or any of that bullshit. Well, that's where it started. So that's where you yeah. have to go if you want to learn about it. All right. So let's, um, let's get into today's show. So, um, I don't want to say this is part three, but it definitely relates to the past two episodes that we've been talking about with the um with the rise of al-qaeda and um you know the events that led to 9-11 we're going to talk about the second iraq war and um you know what were the events and, and what were you know how did everything cascade into an invasion of iraq which eventually cascaded into the global war on terror so um i guess the best place to really start is uh is uh parallel to where we started our Syria podcast, which was back in World War One. Because mm-hmm. here's a quote, here's a quote. So this is a quote from T.E. Lawrence about the British Empire's occupation of Iraq. All you need to do is replace England with America and it remains 100% relevant. So the people of England have been led in Mesopotamia into a trap from which it will be hard to escape with dignity and honor. They have been tricked. In, they have been tricked into it by a steady withholding of information. The Baghdad com- uh, communities are belated, insecure, and complete. Things have been far worse than we have been told. Our administration more bloody and inefficient than the public knows. It is a disgrace to our imperial record. It may soon be to inflame for any ordinary cure. We are day to day not far from a disaster. Mm-hmm. So just replace England with the United States, and that and Mes- been... Mesopotamia with Iraq. Some people might not know that that as yeah. well. Then that would be one hundred percent relevant, right? And what T. E. Lawrence is T. E. Lawrence is is Lawrence of Arabia. Um, he is referring to the Iraqi insurrection of nineteen twenty, so after World War One, right? The British seize control of the country. Um, if you guys remember Sykes Picot, which we've talked about a bunch of times on this podcast, the British and the French made a clandestine clandestine deal to split up the Ottoman Empire, and the British took the southern part, so Iraq, southern Iraq, Jordan, Palestine. The French took the northern part, so northern Syria, uh, northern Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon, and. At the same time as a Arab insurgency in Syria took place and established a government in Damascus with with King Faisal as a head of state, um, there was a popular uprising of both Sunnis and Shiites and and um, you know tribes, people, and city elites 
they all broke into revolt against the British in Iraq. So this revolt was brutally suppressed by the British with, with the combination of, uh, you know, the classic playing tribes against each other and, and also um, bombing cities bombing civilian cities with planes yeah and this invention this eventually led to the british installing the former king of syria king faisal as their puppet king in in uh in iraq so king faisal has had a, a pretty interesting career at this point he was the um you know part of the hashemite family he was uh one of t.e lawrence's main guys in the arab revolts and during world war one he was pretty much elected king of Syria. He was deposed by the French, and now he has a job with the, with, with the British being king of Iraq. And the British, in addition to that, they revert back to the old Ottoman system of putting the minority Sunnis in all the major government positions because this is the origin of the sectarian divide in Iraq that, that leads to like all the bloody civil wars between Sunnis and Shiites after, after Iraq war. Um, the the British uh, essentially giving the Sunnis the dominant power, who are the minority. It's kind of like the reverse of Syria, how the mm -hmm. Syria is is uh, ran by a minority coalition of Alawites, Shiites, and and Christians. You flip that on your head, you have Iraq. Right, um, and, and I got another quote for you that's a little bit further earlier that I think. Um uh that kind of uh, is is a similar parallel as your um lawrence of arabia quote and this is by uh, lieutenant general sir stanley maud uh, of, of uh, great britain and this is in relation to like why they got into mesopotamia or modern day iraq in the first place so he wrote he wrote uh, our armies do not come into your cities and lands as conquerors or enemies but as liberators you people of Baghdad are not to understand that it is the wish of the British government to impose upon you alien institutions. See, the lizard people are real. Um, <laughs> it's the hope that the, of the British government that once again the people of Baghdad shall flourish, enjoying their wealth and substance under institutions which are in consonance with their sacred laws. So this was like the thing that he said in, back in 1917 before the, you know, the revolts in the 20s, um, justifying their incursion into uh iraq now hopefully you know if, if you know anything about the uh, uh in current invasions of iraq it might sound familiar right um we are coming to liberate you from some oppressive you know people so that you can flourish once again and it has nothing to do with the fact that we want to impose anything on you why won't you just let us give you democracy <laughs> yeah and it was true. So, that it was true then of true, quote unquote. It was true then for the British when they were uh, messing around in Mesopotamia, <laughs> and uh, I guess it was true, quote unquote, when you know the United States decided to jump in the ring. Well, a lot of British soldiers during World War One and World War Two. A lot. I was watching this documentary on the Suez Crisis, mm -hmm. and they were interviewing all these British guys, former British soldiers, and they were shocked that they weren't welcomed in Egypt because. The Egyptians were trying, they were actively revolting against the British soldiers there. Right. When Eisenhower brought in UN troops to get Reddit to, uh, and threatened to, to shoot, he threatened to shoot and kill the British soldiers in, in Egypt during mm -hmm. the Suez crisis. Mm -hmm. The Egyptian civilians were throwing stuff and blocking roads so they couldn't escape, so they couldn't get out of the city, hoping that UN troops would shoot and kill them. And they were like, we don't understand why they don't like us. <laughs> we always thought the British Empire was a force for good. We thought people wanted to be part of the British Empire. Yeah. So it was in it was interesting. Other accounts, if you look at Winston Churchill's accounts, Winston Churchill, straight up fucking kind of a piece of shit. Um, but so let's let's fast forward though, for the sake of time, because sure. we can get we can get uh stuck in the details. Um. Fast, fast forward to 1958, which is a very important year in the Middle East. So this is the year that Egypt and Syria, they joined to create the United Arab Republic. And at the same, the same year, the Iraqi monarchy ends up getting slaughtered in a left-wing coup led by Adel Karim Ghassan. Mm -hmm. so, the, the, uh, so this is 
King Faisal's nephew, I think. His whole family is murdered in a really, really outrageously gory coup, coup, coup attempt by a, like a left-wing national movement. And this guy Gossam becomes president. However, the ideological diversity of the coup leaders at this time, um, it, it leads to a, a breakdown in the government. Like, it's, it's, um, it's kind of complicated, but the, the pan-Arabists, they, they reject uh, Gossam's left-wing ideology, and he's eventually killed as well. Um, the CIA was actually sponsoring this coup. As, is, as in tradition and the reason why just like long story short Gossam rubbed a lot of people the wrong way mainly because he tried to he tried to annex Kuwait which was a big which was a which you'll see is a big mistake theme, in Iraq yeah <laughs> which, which is a recurring theme he also wasn't exactly on, on great terms with with uh, Nasser who was kind of the face of Arab nationalism at that time mm -hmm. so he kind of ended up getting fucked um, but this this eventually leads into a very extremely inst unstable uh, period in Iraq. So this is around this is the same time Iraq and Syria, they're basically running a very similar history. Both have kings, both are occupied, one's occupied by the British, one's occupied by the French. They're like two sides of the same coin. They both go through these extremely bloody, dec this, this, very, this very, very bloody decade of nonstop instability and mm. coups. Mm -hmm. They're trying to form a government, and both governments, so just like Syria, same in Iraq, there's a rise in, in uh, pan-Arabism, so like a rebirth of Arab nationalism, and this gives the rise to the Ba'ath Party. What's really interesting, though, is that both the Ba'ath Party in Syria and Iraq actually hate each other. They hate Same party other. hate each other. <laughs> they, they hate each other, and it's it's funny because Syria um, is an Alawite. You can call him a Shia, just to, just to simplify it. Mm -hmm. Who is in a Sunni majority country, mm -hmm. and he you know he runs a, an authoritarian dictatorship. And then on the other hand, you have Saddam Hussein, who is a Sunni in a Shia who, majority with a Shia majority, who mm -hmm. runs an authoritative dictatorship. But both very similar. Um, in a way the government is structured and they go through both very similar histories and like the coup d'etats and all mm -hmm. that shit mm -hmm. so the president of Iraq during this time um, when the Ba'ath Party takes power it's not really he's, he's really old and it's not really effective so you see this guy named Saddam Hussein rise up to the ranks and it's during this time the CIA starts putting out a lot of feelers to see what type of guy Saddam is and if we're able to work with him or not. Mm -hmm. So we start this covert relationship with Saddam before he becomes president of Iraq. And in the late 70s, when he finally does become president, the U.S. actually gives him a list. This is like the, this is the, the litmus test. They gave him a list of 800 Iraqis that we didn't like. So these guys we were gave him a head like, list. We gave him a, a list of 800. It's like, hey, take this list of 800 Iraqis. It's full of um, communists, professors, lawyers, leftists, just like people that the U.S. saw as uh, you know communist sympathizers or who could who could uh, cause Iraq to, to create a stronger relationship with the Soviet Union. He goes ahead and he takes all these people and he fucking kills. He just kills them. He hangs them and he broadcasts it on live TV. So, immediately. See, yeah, like, it was okay. like, whoa, this guy's great. <laughs> like, we didn't even tell him to do anything. <laughs> we just gave <laughs> him some names. <laughs> They're like, how about that? Yeah, fucked up, how, dude. How, how about that? Fucked up. I think we can work with him. It's so well, fucked Saddam, up. we like, we, we uh, really appreciate the enthusiasm. <laughs> Jesus. Seriously, this, this is so fucked up. 800 so, people. 800 of his, of his own people at that. You know, it's not like just 800 I mean, randos. It's 800 Iraqis. It's uh, Saddam Hussein. I mean, this guy. Uh, this guy was pretty bad. Yeah. So, meanwhile, um, something is going. Something very strange is going on in Iran. In the late 70s, Iran has an Islamic revolution. Oh boy. 
We didn't have and anything to do with that though, right? <laughs> we didn't have anything to do with it. So Iran has a Islamic revolution. Um, they overthrow the U.S. backed Shah. Um, listen to some of our, our our Iran episodes for the backstory on that. If you ha- if you don't know, but um, he Saddam Hussein decides to invade Iran, mm-hmm. um, and there's a number of reasons why he decides to do it. One of the reasons why Saddam decides to invade Iran is that Kuzakstan, which is the the part that he wants to annex, is in the southern part of Iran. It is Arabic speaking, so he feels justified in annexing that territory because hey, like they're Arabs. Um, it's also a very oil rich area. So combined with the oil fields that they already have in in Iraq, with with the oil fields in Kuzakstan. Then they would they would rival Saudi Arabia in the amount of oil production. The other big thing is that there's a threat of Shia, uh, the, the threat of a, a Shiite Islamic Republic. Now remember, Iraq is is a majority Shia country, so it, there's a um, a fear that a that the the definite part of the Shia tradition is that is a rejection of tyranny. So there's legitimate fear that a Shia uprising could could essentially depose Saddam Hussein. And there's also right now Iran's military, like at the end of the Iranian Revolution, the military is in complete disarray. So it's kind of like the Soviet Union before World War II. So if you ever like before World War II, when the Germans um, when they secretly, or you know, when they planned Operation Barbosa, when they when they uh, went up into Belarus and they started to invade, they broke their deal with Joseph. Hitler broke his deal with Joseph Stalin. They advanced almost over to Moscow that first year, mm-hmm. in that first major offensive before the before the winter came. They were on their way there, and a big reason why they were so so successful is because. The Soviet military was there was just a major um, purge within the military. Like Stalin had just had a bunch of officers purged to Siberia and uh, and killed because he didn't trust them. So the same sort of thing happened in Iran after the Iranian Revolution. A bunch of loyalists were killed um, after they deposed Reza Shah. So it was a good it was a good timing to do it. Um, also, they weren't on good terms with the U.S., so meaning that they weren't going to get a uh, you know they weren't going to get back. They weren't going to have weapons. Uh, a let well they didn't expect uh, you know F-14s to get you know spare parts from the U.S., which the Iranians had a big supply of. So they thought that they thought the timing was right to to uh, to strike. And when they when they when Saddam invades Iran, they fight an eight year brutal war, very much like World War One. So, the theme was poison gas, trench warfare, uh, stalemates, meat grinders, just meat grinder chaos. Mm-hmm. And the Reagan administration, they provide covert support to Iraq during this war. Right. So we're doing things like. Providing satellite photography to Iraq, um, you know, we're revealing the movements of Iranian forces. Uh, we provide Iraq with intelligence gathered by Saudi Arabia. We're using uh, AWACS. Yeah, we're using AWACS, which is um, air- airborne warning and control systems. It's like a long-range radar uh, for air defense. Iraq uses U.S. military intelligence to to collaborate attacks with mustard gas on Iranian ground troops. Mm-hmm. The, the, the DIA, they secretly provide detailed information on Iranian deployments, also tactical planning. And B- bomb damage assessments, like basically, yeah. if you bomb this place, what will happen, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So U.S. and British companies at this time, they are selling... 
they sell materials to Iraq that could be used to develop a nuclear a, a nuclear or a chemical or a biological weapon. So bio, biological agents for for diseases like anthrax and gangrene and, and you know West Nile virus. Uh, they're selling them the the um, the chemicals that make mustard gas. Chemicals that make sarin gas, rocket programs. Just there's some interesting companies that came out of this that I didn't even know about. There's like a long list of them, but some of the ones that jumped out at me were like Hewlett Packard, Dupont, Honeywell. Uh, Hewlett Packard actually came up a lot. HP, like some of you might have an HP computer, uh, or, or I think I have an HP printer sitting like across the room for me. And they were like basically selling them all the parts and, and things like that to make nuclear reactors rockets uh conventional weapons carl zeiss that was another one i'm assuming that carl zeiss was giving them like optics for like scopes or something like that um but yeah it was it's was super long list of companies and materials that were sold to them during this period what was this like um what year are we on sorry i lost my lost my place we're we're in the 1980s right so like 82 i think it was yeah this was a prolonged operation to covert Saddam Hussein against Iran. Sorry, there's a fly on my head right now, and I'm trying to kill this fucker with a copy of Atlas Shrugged. <laughs> you guys can see it. I actually can see it. That's hilarious. I have a copy of Atlas Shrugged, and I'm going to kill this fucker. <laughs> So we don't have sirens anymore on the podcast, but now we just have this one persistent gnat <laughs> that just pisses Henry off, and then those will be our <laughs> our inter inter um, intermissions. It just it flies in front of my like right between my eyes, <laughs> and I go cross eyed looking at it. And I'm like, what the fuck? And I've been trying to kill it with a copy of um, Atlas Shrugged, and I have a Winston Churchill book called the 40 ways to look at Winston Churchill and the, the combination is not getting the job done I think if you found uh, some more liberal books it might work better but that's just my opinion <laughs> I, have, I have some liberal books somewhere <laughs> somewhere I do have some liberal books but they're all about like Palestine um, alright so back to the 1980s um, okay, so, so the U.S. Look, and the British companies were selling materials and, and things like that to develop all kinds of different weapons, including nuclear, chemical, biological, and just regular bombs and stuff. That's and take in mind that the U.S. is also covertly arming Iran through, <laughs> right. uh, through Iran, through, through third Iran parties. Contra, yeah. through third parties, through Israel. We have a whole they're episode armed. on that one, too. <laughs> So they're covertly selling them parts, but at like a huge markup price. Mm -hmm. Israel is is directly is uh, directly funding Iran. They're selling them two billion dollars in arms each year. Even though they're not friends, <laughs> they're, they're not friends, but they don't like. They hate Saddam Hussein a lot more than they hate Iran. Right. <laughs> um, they see him as a as a much bigger threat. Right. I mean, they're they're closer to them, and they have a better opportunity to create a, a missile program, and they're further in development at this time in a in a, in a nuclear program. Um, they attack in 1982 with uh, collaborating with the Iranians. They actually bomb and destroy in a in a Iraqi nuclear facility. Yep. It was interesting, actually, because the prime minister of Israel, um, Menachem Begin, he called like a televangelist here in the United States, Jerry Falwell, uh, and like gave him a heads up that he was like, yo, tomorrow you're going to hear some shit. Some shit's going to go down. And I just want you to know that we're doing it because we feel like our safety is at stake. And this was kind of like a way for them, Israel, to like gain some some like uh, moral high ground or some cover from the Christian right uh, at the time I keep in mind um, you know this I mean arguably even still to today you know the Christian right happens to be a, a, a big voting block and if you can get their approval their seal approval on different actions and foreign policy then you know you might be able to get away with it but the problem was that Israel had all of these 
uh, F-16s that we had provided to them, and they were supposed to not use them for anything but defensive purposes. And this is explicitly an offensive thing, right? They did a preemptive strike against Iraq to blow up uh, one of their, um, it was the Iraq's Osirak nuclear reactor. Um, and a lot of people in the Reagan administration weren't very happy about that. Um, but, uh, you know, you know, because of the, the, the kind of cover that they got had um, early on from the Christian right, I think they were able to win that, um, win that war of mines, that battle there. Yeah. Um, so towards the end of the war, they, so Saddam starts gassing um, Kurds and it's actually kind of a, it's not a funny story, but it's an interesting story to say the least. So there was a campaign to recover lost territory, lost territory at the end of the war. Um, one of the towns within the conflict zone was the Kurdish village of uh, Halab, Halabja. The Iraq flew over this village with U.S. supplied Bell helicopters, mm. and they gassed them at night hoping to kill the Iranian soldiers in this village. What had happened was that the night before, all the soldiers left the villager, they, all the soldiers had left, and the villagers, um, they returned after the Iranian soldiers left. So, I, I Brack was like, oops, sorry. Yeah, so let me pull that back. You're, you're saying, basically, they went to to hit a Kurdish village because they believed that there was Iranian soldiers there, and there were at, at a certain juncture, and they used very deadly gas kind of indiscriminately on this village so that they can kill the Iranian soldiers. Turns out there's no Iranian soldiers, and they just killed the Kurdish people. Did I get that right? Yeah, that's how it initially started out. The first attack, the first major gas attack on a Kurdish village in March of 1988 it was a accident because they had because Iraq kind of had okay relations with the Kurds at that time. The, the relationships got a lot worse after well, yeah, after that. Yeah, after, after that massacre because man, I forget the exact casualty number, but I think it's something like fifteen hundred people died, something around that. It's over Jesus. a thousand people died in that gas attack. Like overnight, it was a mass an overnight. It was a massacre like it was a terror the footage there is terror is you don't want to look at the footage um so that that kind of cascaded into a larger ethnic genocide just because there were there was resentment in iraqi kurdistan from saddam hussein going forward but this war doesn't the, the Iran Iraq war it ends in a complete stalemate right. so it's an eight year long war no territory is really gained um, you know the beginning of the war Iraq they gained some ground but then Iran pushes them back and you know they plan on you know they have a goal of actually going into Iraq a lot like world how World War two happened Germany pushes they gain some territory then a Soviet Union pushes them they, they push them out and they go all the way over to Berlin. Um, this is very similar in that regard. Um, however, th this war does end in a stalemate. And during the end of the Iran Iraq war, well, one of the, what, according to George H.W. Bush, he says that the, one of the reasons why Iran finally, one of the reasons the war ended is because we shot down an Iranian airliner, a commercial airliner. That was going from Oman to Tehran. Right. That was that was uh, seven hundred and fifty thousand people had died in the war already, and because we killed one, one commercial airplane. airliner, mm -hmm. was was uh, the uh, primary reason why Iran finally signed a peace deal with Iraq. Yeah, and they they till this day use that you know incident as like. Uh, their their grounds for why they chant death to America like that's one of their founding principles or their founding um, opinions on the United States is from that event 
Yeah, I mean, there's on the the beach that the plane. I believe the beach that the it's cemented in Iranian nationalism and history. Mm -hmm. Uh, During the end of the war, though, both Iraq and Iran are broke. So we're talking about a major catastrophic war uh, before we go forward. As far as we know, there was more Iranian casualties just because they weren't as well equipped and there were more bodies to throw in Iran. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, Iran was doing a lot of terrible things too. They were using uh, child soldiers to like run into minefields and stuff like that. Both sides, both evil, uh, both bad. But the the chaos was just tremendous. So they were both broke. They go, they go to OPEC and OPEC agrees to cut oil production in order to raise the price of oil revenues for Iraq and Iran. So they can make their money back, basically. Yeah. However, it doesn't work because somebody's cheating. A UN commission, they discover that Kuwait was flooding the market with oil. In addition, they were slant drilling Iraqi oil fields. Okay, so slant drilling is when you're because Kuwait's super small too, right? So it's it's when you go we drill down and then you drill straight across like basic across the border but underground and steal someone else's oil. In it's this a, case, it was Iraq's oil. <laughs> think of drainage. If you, you ever seen um, there will be blood. Yeah, what what scene are you referring to though? The ending where he's like drainage. <laughs> If I have a straw that goes into your milkshake <laughs> and I I drink your milkshake. That's the scene I'm talking about. You said that more than once on this show. I can't believe I don't remember it every time. <laughs> I drink your milkshake. And he kind of sounds like Bernie Sanders a little bit. <laughs> I drink your milkshake. Um, so... Yeah, slant drilling is that you're drilling underneath land to uh, to mine oil uh, from a another side of the border, essentially. So, what Kuwait is doing is that they are flooding the market with stolen oil from Iraq. They're cheating, as you said. Yeah, they're <laughs> they're they're cheating. So Saddam Hussein he takes this as an act of war. And he goes to April Glapsey, uh, Glaspie, who is the U.S. ambassador of Iraq, and it tells her that, well, she tells him that we have, um, I have the quote, we have considerable sympathy for your quest for higher oil prices, the immediate cause of your confrontation with Kuwait. We know you need funds. We understand that, and our opinion is that you should have the opportunity to rebuild your country. We can see that you have deployed massive numbers of troops in the South. Normally, that would be none of our business. But when this happens in the context of your other threats against Kuwait, then it would be reasonable for us to be concerned. For this reason, I have received an instruction to ask you in the spirit of friendship, not confrontation regarding your intentions. Why are your troops massed so very close to Kuwait's borders? Saddam answers that he intends to try to negotiate a peaceful settlement with Kuwait. So with a gun at their head. <laughs> yeah. Glaspie asks what Saddam so she asked what Saddam would find acceptable and he's like um you know we we're willing to make concessions if um we get these certain strategic airways um and they give us some control of some of these oil fields and she replies by saying that we have no opinion on your Arab, your Arab, Arab conflicts, such as your dispute with Kuwait. And Secretary Baker has directed me to emphasize the instruction first given to Iraq in, 19, in the 1960s that Kuwait, that the Kuwait issue is not associated with America. So Saddam Hussein took that as a green light. Right. He took that as a green light to proceed with the invasion. 
I mean, what, what she's saying is basically like, eh, that's not really our problem. Like, you guys figure it out. She's not saying, like, go for it, bomb them. But they're also not... It. I don't know. It, it's weird to me because it's like, why would you... I don't understand the point of asking the question. What is your? What's the point of your troops being at the border? Like you know what the reason is, and then when he gives you the reason, just be like, yeah, it's not a problem. That part I, I didn't quite understand. Yeah, um, it sounds like she kind of messed up giving him the demands. But what what happens is that. Um, a few days later, Iraq and will invade Kuwait. The battle takes about 48 hours. Um, the Kuwait army ends up, they end up running into Saudi Arabia. It takes them 48 hours to evacuate, really. Like, there is no battle. Mm. So uh, immediate, immediately reports of atrocities start to appear. So things like bayonetting babies and oh. raping raping flight stewards and and uh the bit you know the baby on incubator the what's whole the, baby what's on the incubator ba- what's the baby on incubator so what is that? there were report so there were reports that that um iraqi republican guards were taking babies and they were pulling them out of incubators and letting them die that like, ended like up being, preemies and shit yeah whoa so that ended up being completely false. That never, none of that happened. There oh, was okay. no, there was no organized chaos whatsoever, or there was no, there were, there were not. I don't want to say there's no, there was no atrocities whatsoever. But those atrocities were, were fabricated by a Kuwaiti princess, who had been working with the CIA, mm. and the CIA had coached her to say those things. To say that that the Iraqis were bayoneting babies and raping flight stewards. That they were taking babies off of incubators and mm. stuff like that was like the big the big uh, lie, the babies mm-hmm. on incubators. Mm-hmm. So at first, George Bush doesn't really have a problem with with the invasion, but then Margaret Thatcher... Oh, yeah. ...and changes his mind. This, this is one of our fun stories. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> Margaret Thatcher gets in his ear and, mm-hmm. and changes his mind. They meet in Aspen together, and um, after they are gone for like a day... And the next day, when they are back in a public view, um, his whole tune changes. He starts calling them. He's like, "He's Hitler! Oh, he's Hitler!" Wasn't it that like it like like he he like there was nothing on their calendars? Like nobody knows what could have what was supposed to have gone down. So that either that was a some type top secret mission or something, or <laughs> there's, there's rumors about them having an affair together. I've made the joke before. <laughs> I don't think that happened, but it's it's fun to think about. <laughs> fun to, it's fun to think about it. Um, but she some she got in his ear, so she. I mean, it was mainly British influence that that got us into the first Gulf War. And I think what happened is that she told him that. So, Kuwait was a long was always a, a British colony in the twentieth century was always a part of the British Empire. And I think the British wanted Kuwait back in their sphere of influence. She probably convinced him that this would be an opportunity to get Saudi Arabia back in the U.S. sphere of influence. Why? Because, because the they, Ku- had a fall, Ku- they, had a, they had kind of a falling out in the 70s mm-hmm. um, with with the with gas the crisis, oil, with mm-hmm. the gas crisis. Mm-hmm. So she probably thought. So he was probably thinking, and they probably were talking about how to get these countries back in their sphere, these oil-rich companies back in their sphere of influence. So I think that's probably what what was like the logic behind that, and it was also an opportunity for for Bush to try out a bunch of new military systems. Yeah. So the Patriot missile system comes out of here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's and it was it was really bad. Well, I mean, the Patriot missile system sucked in the Gulf War. Yeah, I can't argue against that. <laughs> You're right. 
It didn't shoot. If, did it shoot down one Scud missile? No. <laughs> it missed like every Scud missile. That's why everyone uses S four hundred or at the S series of of Russian um, missile systems now. So the U.S. mashes Iraq. Um, they kill tens of thousands of civilians doing it, um, which you know they. They kill a lot of human beings in this process. They um, completely uh, condam- contaminate the air, and Iraqi children developed cancer. Um, they killed con- they killed military conscripts while they were running and surrendering. It was mm-hmm. a complete. It was bloodbath. Mm-hmm. Blood, it was a bloodbath. Yeah. Um, they dropped more bombs on our in the Gulf War. I think in any war in human history, That's or one incredible. of the, it's like it's in a. I forget the exact number, but it's like a magnificent number. Um, magnificent, as in just like a large number, right. not as in it not, was not a good. good. Thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So after the war, the UN passes Resolution Six Eighty Seven, so destroy all WMDs. Um. Which, you know, as it applies, it requires Iraq to destroy all their WMDs. Shortly after this, President Bush authorized the CIA to create the conditions for the removal of Saddam Hussein. So not through direct warfare, you know, because they didn't they decided not to march into Baghdad because um, even Dick Cheney himself said that going into Baghdad would create a huge quagmire because there's too much ethnic and sectarian divisions and it would cause like a big it would cause things to go completely out of control and that they would be alone and other countries would realize that it would be a bad idea um, Dick Cheney I'm saying it's, it's coming smart from smart words if only he would have heeded them you know instead they do convince minority groups uh, to to uh to rebel against Saddam Hussein, but they just kind of leave him hanging, mm. and Saddam Hussein ends up massacring these people. Right. But we, Bush authorizes the, the CIA to create these conditions to remove Saddam Hussein from uh, from power. Start building the and case, so to speak. The C- right. The CIA contacts Ahmad Chalabi, a a Iraqi exile, um, really just career criminal, bank fraudsters, embezzler, just kind of crooked person. Comes from, um, who's comes from a, a long line of like very rich people with ties to, you know, um, monarchies and and money, Hashemite monarchies and a whole lot of money. And with them, they create the Iraqi National Congress, which was a group of uh, anti. It was just like a collection of anti-Saddam people, so opposition groups, um, mainly like just wealthy anti, wealthy exiles um, would be the best way to describe them. Uh, and then also, I mean, that would be the head of the group, and then there's other opposition figures. So the INC, um, they set up like what the INC does it's like it's it's really interesting they set up a phony newspaper filled with stories of of uh, Saddam Hussein abuses so according to um, CIA agent Robert Baer it was something like a I'm going to read a quote it was something like a spy novel it was a room where people were scanning Iraqi intelligence documents into computers in doing disinformation. There was a whole wing of it that he did forgeries in. He was forging back then in order to bring him down Saddam. So it became sort of like an intelligence shopping mall. Because they were getting the intelligence documents in and then also making fake news at the same time. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. This sounds so, super similar to like what we did in Iran with, um, with Kermit. <laughs> Uh, I'm buying up all the newspapers and just writing a bunch of bullshit to try and stir up an insurrection. Sounds pretty similar. Yeah. It's um, it's the same playbook. 
what what's the word that you call um, like propaganda like inner the term for propaganda when you uh, submit it in a different country mm. yeah. whatever yeah so that <laughs> that so um, Chalby also though he creates a, a, like a militia army out of a thousand fighters and and the northern Kurdish controlled region of Iraq and then bribes tribal leaders and in Mosul to support a planned rebellion against Saddam Hussein. At the same time he's also hosting members of Iranian intelligence who promise that when the operation is launched Iran will hit Iraq from the south. So I think I think that so there's rumors that Chalabi was a double agent for Iran. For Iran? Yeah. How because so? what he did, I mean, just think of the consequence. Like, think about what happened after the Iraq War. Who benefited the most? Iran. Iran. Mm-hmm. The, he. They, may they took out the Sunni secular leader and they, and they put the Shias in charge at the end of the war. And that's where Iranian the Iranian tentacles really came in. So they really achieved Iran Iranian foreign policy goals. Yeah, I guess if you put it that way, for sure. And kind of the same thing is happening now, you know, or at least continuing till today. The reason why uh, Iran is is so heavily involved in Iraq to today. Well, that's where it starts. It starts right. with the invasion of Iraq after mm-hmm. 2003, right. when one man, one vote, um, when the Ayatollah, when Ski, when Skiri, um, comes to power, and the when the Shiites vote for a Shia chauvinist government in Baghdad, which hadn't been the case in like 600 years or something like that. <laughs> Since since the 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 capital of the uh, Arab Empire wasn't even in since the caliphate wasn't even located uh, was located in Cairo, so the CIA learns that so he's setting up a, a militia with a thousand fighters. Uh, the CIA does learn that that. Uh, that Baptist officials have caught wind of the plot and they tell Chalabi, don't do this. You're going to be on your own. He does it anyway. Hmm. The plan fails and the CIA is furious. The CIA actually cuts ties with Chalabi after this. Mm -hmm. And Robert Baer, who was like his, his handler, he said he says the quality of the the INC's intelligence was really bad. That there was a feeling that Chalabi was prepping defectors, and that we had no systematic way to vet the information, but it was obvious most of it was cooked. So they didn't even trust the CIA. Uh, didn't even trust this guy's intelligence. They they realized this guy was just some like monarchist type. I mean, who wanted to overthrow the government? Who is really be pretty just, bad to not who, get? Who is, who is seeking? Who is seeking regime change for you know his own personal reasons? Um, his own you know his he was seeking regime change because he wanted power in Iraq. Right. I mean, he's super. Like his whole family was super closely connected with Hashemite kings for like since forever. You know, like. Um, well, that's what he told. That's what he ends up telling the neocons later. Right. Is that hey, don't worry. When Saddam Hussein is gone, we'll just put a Hashemite king in charge. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They'll love this. The Iraqis will love being ruled by a Hashemite king. Yeah, I think I think basically like his great grandfather, his grandfather was like a tax collector for a Hashemite king, and then like his father and his mother were both kind of like very politically, you know, involved uh, with uh, the Hashemite monarchies, and and then later when um, Kalibi founds um, uh, the Petra Bank in Jordan, uh, he lends him and his bank lends Prince Hassan. 
who became like a really close friend of, of Kalibi. Um, he lends him like $30 million, um, which I think helped him to then start opening up bank branches in, um, in the Israeli occupied West Bank. Um, that's kind of besides the point though. I, I, he, he has a long, super long history with, with all these kings and, and it was clear, I think, from this that the motivation was, you know, selfish in nature. Yeah, the guy was a bastard. Um, meanwhile, um, so I, one of the demands is that Iraq destroy all of their all their WMDs and chemical weapons. Most of these weapons are weapons that the U.S. sold them. So the U.S. knows that Iraq has chemical weapons weapons of mass destruction, which is kind of vague. Um, it, a lot of things fall under WMDs because we they have the receipt. You know, we, we have the receipts on these. We were the ones selling them during the Iran-Iraq war. So between 1991 and 1997, Iraq destroys the vast majority of all of their weapons. So I have this written down. So they destroy more than, more than 38,000 Filled and unfilled chemical uh, munitions. Munitions. 690, 690 tons of chemical warfare agents. Over 3,000 tons of precursor chemicals. More than 400 pieces of production equipment. 48 missiles, 8 mobile missile launchers, and 29 missile warheads modified to carry chemical or biological agents. So, after cross-referencing weapons... Um, after cross-referencing this, UN inspectors conclude that 90% of Iraq's weapons have been destroyed or dismantled. Scott Ritter, who was the chief UN inspector, said that the remaining 10% was most likely destroyed during the first Gulf War. Hans Blix, also in 1997, also comes out and he says that there is no evidence that Iraq has an active nuclear weapons program. So then, How, if, if they if they didn't have a nuclear weapons program, why did Saddam kick the UN's weapons inspectors out? Because the U.S. installed video surveillance systems whenever UN inspectors would go, and they were so they were spying on Saddam in, in the Iraqi military. Mm. That's why he threw them out, because he was scared that they were going to assassinate him. Really, I mean, that's a founded fear. <laughs> Uh, he didn't know it, but they were definitely cooking up the, you know, the the case to have him deposed at that time. So, but it didn't. I, it also didn't look good for him because, like, kicking out the UN's weapons inspectors was basically like signing his own death warrant. It's like, see, look, you know, there's this ten percent of uh, weapons that we can't account for, and he's not letting the weapons inspectors come in and verify it, even though, you know. Guys like Hans Blix and Scott Ritter had already said that it was probably destroyed already. Um, it, it's just not a good look for Saddam. Doesn't look very good for him, even if he was, you know, worried that he was going to get offed. Yeah. In hindsight, maybe it wasn't. It wasn't the smartest strategic move. But he offered to debate George Bush before the Iraq War on on uh, his WMD stockpile. George H W or George George, George W w, George George W Bush. Oh nope. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't take that. <laughs> That's not a good idea. <laughs> yeah. So around this time, um, Ahmad Chalabi he starts to court the neoconservatives. So Chalabi tells them that if he replaces Saddam Hussein, that he would normalize relations with Israel and allow the construction of a pipeline from Mosul to Haifa. That's they, an interesting that's an interesting proposition, I think. I think that's a, that's an important proposition because if you look at like way back in the fucking 40s like post World War II, we have both British uh, and Americans like, you know, heads of state who are who are openly admitting that, you know, gaining access to Middle Eastern oil and like controlling that region is like crucial for domination. I think if I can pull this up real fast, um, the 
there's a British paper that had said that um, the Middle East is a vital prize for any power seeking uh, domination. So uh, there was like a paper um, put out by the British government that, you know, basically said that this was the, you know, this was the premium p power interest in world influence or world domination. And this is way back in 47, right? And and then a second thing to, to note on this one is the, the kind of deal that the United States has, you know, somewhat under the table with uh, Israel, whereby we are agreeing or promising uh, to ensure Israel's energy security, right? Like indefinitely. And pretty much every five years, this, this agreement had been re-upped every single year. This was uh, in 75, uh, Kissinger signs the Memorandum of Understanding, it was called, and it was um, kind of making Israel, uh, making us obligating, obligated to provide Israel with a security of, of oil reserves and, and energy supplies in, in a, quote, time of crisis. What this ended up doing, though, if we skip forward quite a bit to about 2002, is that, you know, the we keep renewing this this agreement and every time we renew this agreement there's always these additional you know uh, uh, special legislations that are attached so in one particular one it says that uh, the US uh, actually has to provide Israel with strategic oil reserves even during domestic uh, shortages and that ran up a bill for us at the time uh, in 2002 of about $3 billion. Um, and we were also kind of um, uh, on the hook to uh, provide our own oil tankers if regional oil tankers refuse to ship you know, uh, to Israel. So we've got, um, so the reason why I'm pointing all this stuff out is because, you know, Jalabi is now going to all of these, you know, um, uh, neocons and he's saying, hey, I can normalize relations with Israel and I'll build you the pipeline from the Middle East and all that oil straight to Haifa, right? So it's like kind of checking off a couple of boxes, right? It's checking off the very historic idea that control of the Middle East is, is vital for power domination. It's setting up a direct pipeline and a, and a, um, a, a direct satisfaction of the agreement between the United States and Israel for energy security and, and um, guarantees on energy security. And uh, yeah, I think those are the, those are two very important points. So I, I bet it rings real clearly in, in those neocons ears. And yeah, David Wormser, um, who was the director of the Middle Eastern program for the American Enterprise Institute, um, he released a, an op-ed like right like when he met after he met Chalabi on the uh, in the Wall Street Journal and the title was Iraq needs a revolution and in this article he just advocates for for, for Chalabi he, he advocates for the re resurrection of the INC because the CIA had stopped funding the INC had stopped working with the INC because all their stuff was bullshit mm-hmm and they knew it, and they were incompetent. Right. And he, they, they, it wasn't working out. There were no Muhajideen. You know what I mean? Right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> there were no Muhajideen. <laughs> it's like no one. No wonder the U.S. Um, whenever they sponsor mercenaries, they sponsor um, the, radical the Islamists. The worst ones. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, have you seen their work? <laughs> um. They also so PNAC, um, they also write a letter to Bill Clinton urging him to remove Saddam from power. And Clinton does eventually sign into law the Iraqi Liberation Act, which like which states that the US will pursue a policy of, of regime change. But I guess the neoconservatives is a is a good thing to stick on. Um, I think the best way to describe like what I said to you earlier, the the neoconservative movement is the intersection of the MIC and the Israel lobby. Mm -hmm. So these guys all came up working for um, Senator Scoop Jackson, who was a hardline Cold War uh, a Cold Warrior. So we're talking about guys like Bill Kristol, who 
I'm disappointed that I didn't get to see the debate from Scott Horton. Yeah, yeah. I wish that we we bought tickets like a year in advance for that, and and well, coronavirus ruins everything. Um, Scooter Libby, uh, David Wormser, Paul Wolfowitz, Donald Rumsfeld. Um, the craziest among them was it. Well, he's still alive. Richard Pearl, mm-hmm. um, along with being the fattest and ugliest neocon <laughs> yeah <laughs> he's he's a very he's just a fat ugly fat <laughs> yeah so have you heard of the clean break uh yeah yeah totally we've talked about this yeah. before so he writes a policy paper for benjamin Netanyahu when he was a first when he was first elected uh, Prime Minister of Israel back in 1996 and is titled A Clean Break, A New Strategy for Securing the Realm. And the paper, um, it advocates for a lot of the same policies that were advocated by Onan Yunan in the 1980s. We've talked about this Israeli policy paper that was right. written. Mm-hmm. It advocates for, it's kind of like, kind of like a continuation of that. Um, but like the main things that it points out is that uh, it, it it recommends that Israel pursue the downfall of their Arab neighbors, especially Syria and Iraq. Hmm. And the way b- to do this is by exploiting ethnic and sectarian tensions. The first step of this is to remove Saddam Hussein in Iraq. Because their thinking is that, or Richard Pearl's thinking is, which kind of represents the consensus of the neocons, because a war in Iraq would just completely spiral out of control and destabilize the entire Middle East. And, I mean, what happened? It's not wrong. (laughs) It's not wrong. (laughs) Yeah, they were right. I think any Middle Eastern... It's not like we don't have good analysts who are, are able to um, at the very least, predict things that seem very predictable. I mean, we had top analysts, like hundreds of thousands of them, crunching all the numbers and getting all the data. I think part of the data might have been false, unfortunately, been totally fabricated and falsified so that they can fit a particular narrative or you know a particular ideology. I'm, I'm pointing at you, neocons. Um, I'm talking about the history. Like people, there's enough people who should know Middle Eastern history to know that, like, these, these countries are time bombs, right? So it's very easy to removing a strongman dictator and uh, fostering sectarian tensions will will turn out very poorly. Think about all the terrorist groups that were created in Iraq that never existed in Iraq prior mm-hmm. to prior to 2003 and after 2003 there was no such thing as al-Qaeda in Iraq right there was no such thing as the the Bada brigade mm-hmm. there was no such thing as ISIS there was no such thing as Khatib Hezbollah right. at least i don't think there was a Khatib Hezbollah before the, the Iraq war right mm-hmm. there was no al news or front so mm-hmm. all these militias mercenary groups or or whatever all these mercenary groups are were created as a result of sectarian infighting and um, and just complete instability because after the Iraq war basically Sunnis were were kind of trying to grasp on you know hang on the power and they were straight up murdering Shiites and you know they if there was a Sunni Shiite village then the one side would kill the other side mm-hmm. and then when other would one side uh, engages in that behavior it forces the other side to to, to band to respond, together right mm-hmm. to, to respond and band together mm-hmm. So it just creates like this nonstop war. And during Saddam Hussein's reign, the one thing that you can say is that there wasn't this in Baghdad at the very least, in like the urban metropolitan areas, I think fifty percent of the couples were were uh, interfaith marriages. Really? So they're Sunni. I didn't actually know that. Married to each yeah. other. 
That's interesting. Yeah. But I so, mean, they were mostly. It was like the, the, his government was secular. You know, like they weren't like a. They weren't like a like an Islamic republic. <laughs> you know, so. I mean, I, mean, I guess that's they, kind of a product of that, not they were, necessarily they were, a product of like he's a good ruler. <laughs> you know, I don't. I, I, that's a normal yeah, thing. Yeah. Like that's something that is is it's like a what normal right. sign of like a healthy society, like right. interfaith marriages, right? And uh, inter inter race marriages and interfaith marriages are, are a sign that there's not prevalent racism in, right. in your country if or sectarianism for that matter you know or sectarianism mm -hmm. uh, or however people divide themselves right it means that you know this it's somewhat of a healthy environment if there's a large portion of these uh you know families that are forming right. that are putting putting aside these differences i was always taught when after 9 11 that i remember being told that Iraqi women, when they went to school, get, uh, that uh, chemicals were thrown in their face whenever they try to go to school in yeah. Iraq. In Iraq, because they were so mean to women. Yeah, in Iraq. I remember being told that by yeah. teachers. I've never heard that one before. Well, I'm probably good. <laughs> Maybe it was just one person who is uh, some one adult who was uh, just feeding you like fake news you bullshit. <laughs> but I remember here, I remember that story. I had a teacher telling me that, and I remember this very vividly. That oh, like in Iraq, the government throws chemicals in women's faces if they go to school. The government. So you should be happy that you you're able to go to school here. And I was like, huh? Those fucking Iraqis. You no, know, at the time when I was like in seventh, eighth grade, I was like, yeah, I was like, I, I was going to, I was prepared to believe this sort of stuff. Right. But, but um, yeah. I mean, a lot of this came advocate. from those, those, these papers that you're talking about, right? Like a lot of, a lot of those ideologies came from the, the PNAC papers that came out. Yeah. And there's a bunch of them. There's a bunch of these papers that, that, um, that were published if you're going to look at one paper, though, from PNAC, hmm. you should. PNAC is is a project for a new American century. They're they're a think they're a neoconservative think tank that's that uh, came up in 1997, and um, there's this one policy paper that we've talked about before. Yeah, we went in depth on it. It was we fun. went in depth on this. But if you're going to read one policy paper from PNAC, type in "rebuilding America's defenses." It's a trip. And just read this entire thing. You're going to be like, who the fuck just, who, who wrote this? <laughs> like, if you said that L. Ron Hubbard wrote it, I would believe you. Yep. Because <laughs> it may as well have been L. Ron Hubbard who wrote this as like a plot about Lord Xenu's ideology. <laughs> I mean, at certain point, like I was surprised that it didn't end with lizard people. To be very honest, so spoiler alert: there's no lizard people in that paper. But you might, you can, you can totally insert it, and it wouldn't feel out of place. So in this paper, they call for just all sorts of, just quite frankly, insane policy. So they write out the blueprint for for Pax Americana. Like Pax, Pax Romana. Mm -hmm. Why would you? Peace what's through the strength. point of having like Pax Americana? Because we've all heard what Pax, uh, Pax Romana was. It's Pax Romana, right? I'm not mm -hmm. just yeah, 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 that. you're getting it yet. Mm -hmm. The the peak up like when Marcus Aurelius was the emperor of, right. of Rome mm -hmm. in like the year eight in the year like what eighty nine A.D. I think that Something was like the like official that, year. Yeah. And um, the British Empire, not the British, the Roman Empire, may as well have been the British. The Roman Empire <laughs> expanded from from um, Egypt all the way to Germany, to Britain. It In the north, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it controlled like a big... Like pretty much everything. At its, yeah. at its height of territory. The right. only thing that they didn't control in the main world, in the known world, was, was Eastern Asia right. and like the steppes. The steppe people, who the they Mongols, were never able, they were never able to fight the steppe people. Nope. Whenever they, whenever they ventured out too far to the, to the into, plains. 
into the plains, the Roman the, legions would get destroyed get by yeah. horseback ra- raiders. Yep. Yeah, they would get wrecked. Um. Anyway, Pax Americana. Pax like Americana. A, it's, it's basically an expansionist idea of like, you know, let's just dominate everything and that's how we're going to establish peace. Yeah, they also call for the transformation of the military, um, usurping the UN. Which is nuts in and of itself. Re- but... Removing hostile dictators. Um, they so call for... The, that one we're still kind of doing. <laughs> yeah, that was still, I mean, that's not... That's still kind that's of still part of the playbook, yeah. Mm-hmm. The expansion of bases. Um, they call Expensive. for a, spa- a space command. That's the only one I'm on board with for the entire paper. <laughs> they call for a space command. Um, they also target weapons that target people by genome. Yeah, it starts getting super weird. Yeah, and I'm telling you, at mm-hmm. the end of this paper, when you get to the, towards the end of it. There is, there are some, these are the weirdest parts of the paper. Like, the other things could come from Mike Pompeo, fucking fat face, mm-hmm. eating McDonald's. The, it's, weapons target people, weapons that target people by genotypes is just incredibly uncomfortable for any normal person. Yeah. Like, I never even would have thought of that, ever. Yeah. Because I'm because I'm normal, right? Also, um, like, would you ever think of that? Like, would you if you were no, just, if you were even writing a fantasy? Like, let's just say if you were like let's if you're like trying to come up with a very fun make pretend idea, right. like oh, imagine if we're like fighting space demons and like killing aliens, right? Oh, uh, you no, know, I'll shoot them so up, first we're gonna look at their genotype them. and we're gonna specifically target only them with this ridiculous. Oh, it's that's some fucked up shit, dude. You have to be like some new brand of psychopath, like new brand of just nuts to think like how can we specifically target a race or a specific because that's what it is. Like, let's be real. Targeting a specific genotype is saying, I want to pick out who should die from this particular weapon. It's nuts. By, by their... By, by race. Their genetics. Mm-hmm. So uh, by their DNA, by the weapon that monitors, I guess, that's able to track or or recognize someone's DNA. Right. Just igno- ignore certain sets of DNA and, and specifically target others, which is just fucking nuts. By the way, uh, Will DeMarco, props to you. Thank you. He writes, and he gave us the uh, corrected time for the Pax Romana, which is 30 BC, uh, Augustus Caesar, to Marcus Aurelius's death in 180 AD. I guess 89, 89 AD does kind of fit right in the middle of that, so I think you weren't too far off there, but thanks for the, uh, for the uh, tip, Will. I know that was the, that was like the, the, Augustus Caesar. Well, that's the start of the Roman Empire mm-hmm. with Augustus Caesar, and then the Roman Empire ends with fuck. God damn. Well, I I consider the end of it when when they split, really. To like the eastern and the western. To the eastern and the western, mm-hmm. but I mean, what do I know? Who are you? To I just say? know that Marcus Aurelius is the emperor in the movie gladiator which is one of the best movies ever made best monologues in any movie best historical best period piece of all time yeah i take it i think it's better than braveheart actually i don't know i love ridley scott movies but that's a that's a side note in general no i will have my vengeance in this life or the next um, but yeah Where were we? so one of the most alarming things though about this paper is that it's not only just like the weapon stuff at the end of it so to there's a quote and it says further the process to further process of trans to further the process of process of transformation even if it brings revolutionary change is likely likely to be a long one, absent some catastrophic and catalyzing event like a new Pearl Harbor. Hmm. Hmm. I don't even know what to say about that, to be honest. Yeah, it's weird. It's very weird. 
I just got finished reading uh, Max Blumenthal's book, uh, Management of Savagery. Oh, you finished it? How was it? It's great. I, I recommend it to anyone, um, to anyone and everyone. But I just finished. He has a chapter on on um, the Iraq War and 9-11. And he's, his conclusion is that he hasn't really come up with a strong conclusion, but he suggests that Osama bin Laden had read uh, rebuilding America's defenses and hit the purpose was that he saw that these neoconservatives were looking for a new Pearl Harbor so he figured that a attack on the United States would trigger a US invasion that's kind of like what he suggests in his chapter in his chapter about 9-11 about some of Osama bin Laden's motivations he doesn't make a strong suggestion he doesn't make a like it's not his like overall conclusion in the book but it's a suggestion that he does make mm. which I find you know it's an interesting idea so um, after George Bush is elected um, all these longtime analysts are, are transferred out of the Pentagon and all these neoconservatives come in and transferred out is a nice way to say it. I, I say they got fucking booted they got shit canned <laughs> They got shit canned, yeah. Because like there were certain positions where like if you were to tra- I forget exactly the exact position what they were called, but there are certain seats where if you change like the head of this one particular department, uh, that person would stay in like this interim role to like train up the next person, and like they just said, nah, we're not doing that. There's like no no guard no changing of the guard process whatsoever for a lot of these roles. Well, they, they were in a rush to bring in these neoconservatives. And it was really Dick Cheney who was spearheading this. Right. Because George Bush was a fucking idiot. <laughs> yeah. Um, he was too busy painting. He's too, yeah, he's too busy. He's either painting or at his ranch. Right. But, I mean, they seize, after 9 11, they seize on the opportunity to create. I guess, the, you know, what their main objective is, is, is to create a link between Al Qaeda and Iraq. Because remember, you know, you need a new Pearl Harbor like event to trigger this transformation that these neocons are talking about um so dick cheney and donald rumsfeld and paul wolfowitz they create this secretive um ad hoc intelligence bureau within the pentagon and they call themselves the cabal see those those fucking aliens the lizard people that's what they call themselves to this dark cabal and they they drive U.S. foreign policy, <laughs> and they're and, and what they're doing is that they're just in, they're spinning intelligence reporting uh, to prompt a specific goal, and that goal is to invade Iraq. Right. This is the group that becomes the Office of Special Plans, which is a secret office within the Pentagon, headed by Douglas Fife, mm-hmm. and they gather and interpret raw intelligence data. They refuse uh, any participation from the CIA and the DIA, and they cherry pick talking points out of unverified rumors and tall stories fed to them by the Iraqi National Congress, led by Chalabi. Mm-hmm. Because Chalabi is the one who's feeding them all this, all this fucking bo- bonus and inf- all this bogus information yeah, but even this about, it's so weird about that not to get ahead of ourselves here but like even the cia didn't trust this dude why were they like buying this shit they weren't it's not that they tr- they didn't care about whether, whether he was trustworthy or not is that he was giving them the the correct talking points to pursue their policy goals they didn't give a fuck about if it was accurate or not yeah. You think they cared? Yeah, I mean, I know we're going to talk about Judith Miller in a second, but like, I watched a a, a video uh, of her today just before this for, on PragerU, go figure of all places. But like, it was straight from the horse's mouth, you know. So I was like, let me listen to what she has to say, and she was she like, she was on PragerU, dude. The f- you should watch this video; it's fucking crazy because the first words out of her mouth was uh, something to the tune of like, you know, I got us into Iraq. Like literally was like the first fucking sentence she says. And then and then she goes on to make the argument that it wasn't lies, it was like, you know, uh misinformation or something like that, you know? And like they were all they they made a mistake. 
and the, the information the, the the information wasn't good or some shit like that it was so dumb but I, I just like blown away by the first fucking sentence she said sorry I don't mean to like I know you're gonna talk about Drew Miller in, in a bit oh no no feel free like, let's let's go down this rabbit hole I, I loved how shitty on PragerU <laughs> I have seen and heard the dumbest videos I've ever heard from a conservative outlet yeah on yeah. Prager View, yeah. on that on that YouTube channel, they are the dumbest, most ignorant pieces of material I've ever seen. And you know they're they're rebranding a lot. Actually, uh, this is something I noticed. I because I, I actually do subscribe to them. Don't don't hate on me. I'm trying to break out of my bubble and hear what everyone has to say. Uh, I don't believe. Yeah, but at least lo- listen to a good conservative. <laughs> no, don't no, no. To fucking I, I I listen you know to them. I listen to them literally be right. for for comedic value. Like because some of the shit they said is, hey is just like stupid Prager. as fuck. Well, Dennis Prager isn't. He's he's not the fr- he, <laughs> he's not he's not the front man anymore, dude. I watched this video not too long ago, uh, that was like headed up by like this young looking kid. I've never seen him in my life before. There was no mention of Dennis Prager. Like it was like filmed and shot very nicely. It was edited extremely well. Even the music sounded like trendy. It was like kind of a future trap hip hop kind of something in the background. But what they're saying is like this bullshit, like neoconservative nonsense, you know? They're rebranding and it is trendy and it is dangerous in my opinion. I I think they've got a very, very perverted outlook and interpretation of events as they have unfolded you need to listen you need to watch alan dershowitz's <laughs> video on israel palestine and it is perhaps i mean alan dershowitz he's the most the, the 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 stupidest thing i've ever seen in my entire life the most inaccurate video i have ever seen about israel palestine yeah where he just fabricates and makes things comp- up the uh, the one they had on the Iraq War, they had another one on the Iraq War. I forgot who did this. Blamed the Iraq War on the Arab mindset. Really? No, excuse me. That was the one on Israel Palestine. Oh, okay. Alan Dershowitz blames the is like the the Palestinians on the Arab mindset. Right, that, that was the, that's what like what it's a graph. Mm-hmm. It says Arab mindset. Mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, mm-hmm. this is. This is just insane. Like this is in- insane to think like this. It's the Arab mindset. It's it, it's um, like kind of ignoring, like willfully ignoring, you know, all of history, like the entire <laughs> yeah. history of yeah. the It's willfully. Well, just because they're fucking crazy Arabs. That's the reason why they're all pissed off. <laughs> it's like it has nothing to do. <laughs> nothing to do with like the fact Sykes that Sykes Pico like, demolished their <laughs> yeah. homes. But like has nothing to do with yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So nothing, nothing to do with like the uh, settlements that we are making, right? No. Uh, nothing to do with the big wall that's around uh, Gaza and the calorie. Uh, yeah, and that, that's all like that's all like like contemporary shit. It, it doesn't even like even touch on like the historical backdrop that like leads up to all of these events. Anyway, I digress. Let's talk about Judith. It's it's a. It, just fun fact about Dennis Prager. So Officer Bar Brady is based off in South Park is based off Dennis Prager. Is he? I didn't know that. That's interesting. Hey, move along here. Nothing to see here. I'm Dennis Prager. Um, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Um, anyway, Judith Miller. Uh, so you know, let, let's talk about her. Let's talk about the anthrax first. So oh, all right, all right. between between September and November, there are a series of anthrax attacks that are targeted at U.S. senators and their journalists. And the media creates a link uh, between Saddam Hussein and and Al-Qaeda through these anthrax attacks. And despite all the evidence, that the person who sent this anthrax out was from the United States. He killed himself. It was from a lab in the United States who sent all this anthrax out. Uh Um, But it was spun into a report that Muhammad Atta, the lead hijacker in 9-11, had received the anthrax from Iraqi intelligence while in Prague, which was 100% inaccurate, never happened. No, did did not happen. Even Robert Mueller 
came out and said that no, this never happened. Bobby Mulls said it didn't happen. Then this, it definitely this, didn't this happen. Never, this never happened. We we ran down all of the we, we ran down hundreds of leads and checked every record we could get our hands on and we there's no evidence that Muhammad Atta was ever in Prague at this time. All of the evidence points that he was in Florida at during this time. They still so in the New York Times, after Robert Mueller even makes that statement, they still publish an article called Mr. Atta Goes to Prague, which just just is a report on that story about how yeah. the U.S. and, and, uh, Chez, and Czech officials um, are, you know, they they have intelligence on this, this uh, meeting between Iraqi intelligence officers and, and Muhammad Atta. And when Dick Cheney is using this as a pretext, he calls the Czech Republic Czechoslovakia. Because it shows that's, you. I mean, that's all right. In fairness, it just shows you. you like, come on, man. You're 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 a journalist. I get it. I get it. I get it. I get it. You are the Secretary of Defense for all George right, Secretary H. W. Bush, Bush. Hmm. and you're the Vice President right now. You're an educated man. You don't know that the name changed after the Cold War. It really shows where your mindset is. Right, right. Like, your mindset is back in, like, the fucking 1980s. I mean... Oh, the Czechoslovakia. <laughs> okay, oh, yeah, I guess, I'm okay, in, fair, in, fa in fairness, I, I could see that being a quick gaffe, you know? Well, even if it's written, I could see that being, as, being a quick gaffe, but was this, like, something that happened frequently? Was it, like, more than one occurrence of this? I forget exactly what... It was on the... He was talking to some news outlet but he called it when explaining mm -hmm. I held his ties he was like hey I chuckles you know we have reports in Czechoslovakia mm -hmm. it, it just it's overall overall uh, level of ignorance and I don't think these neoconservatives are smart I just think they're criminals um, <laughs> yeah. so a lot of these guys I don't think they're necessarily like super smart and intelligent i think they're smart enough to get by get by with their criminal activity so D judith miller um so colin powell went on fox in 2002 and said that iraq had chemical and biological weapons stocks and saddam hussein was building a nuclear weapon and what he did is that they're like okay well, how do you know this and he cited a New York Times article by Judith Miller as evidence so here's what they would do so the INC would pass on their carefully um, collaborated lies to Judith Miller who was having an affair with with Scooter Libby? By mm -hmm. the way, mm -hmm. he was she was Scooter Libby's lover, mm -hmm. who would put them on the front page of the New York Times, just in time for Dick Cheney or Colin Powell to be asked about it on Meet the Press. Right. Right. They would basically serve up the bullshit so that the uh, the daytime talk shows are easy. Yeah, well, they would just serve up. Well, not just the daytime talk shows. We're talking about Congress, right? Like they would testify in Congress. They'd be like, mm -hmm. "Okay, so what's your evidence?" Well, the New York Times, right? So they would just rehash. When it's a they circle be, jerk, right? Right. Yeah, like, the giant circle jerk. Right. They would feed out intelligence to these news reporters and then cite their own bogus sources as evidence. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, um, James Moore, who was a CIA analyst, said that the the White House had a perfect deal with with Miller. Uh, Chalabi was providing the Bush people with information they need to support their political objectives with Iraq, and he's supplying the same material to, to Judith Miller. Chalabi tips her on something and then she goes to the White House which has already heard the same thing from Chalabi 
and she gets it corroborated by some insider she's always described as a senior administration official. An unnamed source in the administration. So there's so many, there's, there's like a lot of like false reporting and she's, she went to jail for this. Right. So for, for example, um, so in, in September of 2002, she reported on the front page of the times that, um, the U S had intercepted aluminum tubes indicating that Saddam was developing a nuclear bomb. Don't even get me started on the aluminum tubes. Can I, can I jump in on that one? I'll make it yeah. real fast for this one. So this one's crazy. Uh, because, you know, basically they're using this these aluminum tubes as evidence that they're building a, a WMD. They're building a bomb because they're buying all these aluminum tubes. What else are they using the aluminum tubes for? What they're what they're trying to suggest is that uh, that the Iraq Survey Group, which determined what these tubes would be used for or could be used for was that they would be using them for 81 millimeter rockets, right? And there was no evidence found anywhere that there was a program to design or develop 81 millimeter aluminum rotors for like a uranium centrifuge, which is what you would, you know, create in order to make uh, a highly enriched uranium. They were just using it for fucking rockets, like regular bombs. Now, could you make the argument like they were making rockets so that they can put a uh, nuclear warhead on it? Sure, you can say that. But that's not what they were saying. They were saying these nuclear, t these aluminum tubes were being used to make these centrifuges. But here's the thing. They're talking about a zip type centrifuge, which was originally produced in, 19, in the 1950s. Um, it's a gas centrifuge. It's named after one of its main developers. It's like a German scientist, Gerno Zip. Uh, and basically it uses these, these rotors uh, that are normally made of like really strong material. Aluminum is one of them. Uh, but they have to be like high strength and, and specialized types of materials. After the 1950s, nobody uses aluminum anymore um, for these gas centrifuges. Like literally nobody in the whole world. They start making them out of things like uh, margin steel and carbon fiber instead because they're just much more useful and beneficial. So they're trying to say, hey, oh look, they bought all these 81 millimeter tubes made of aluminum so that they can make these centrifuges. Nobody uses that shit anymore. Sorry, I, I was like, that's, I, I guess not everybody's a nerd, but you know. The Security Council was like, well, they're buying, they're like, what's your evidence that they're buying nuclear? Well, you know, the aluminum tubes they have, are, it's just so alarming that we it, it must be a nuclear bomb it's like I don't even know how to like describe it it's like, the, you know who's the only person who, who made fun of this and mocked us the only no one from this is the only person Dave Chappelle right remember the Dave Chappelle yes. skit with Black Bush mm -hmm. he was like aluminum too <laughs> he's the only person who made a mockery of this right they didn't see it on it was, a, it, was a, it was a joke it was literally a joke like no nobody would even people who don't know shit about like zip type um gas centrifuges for uranium enrichment even people who don't know shit about that heard this story that they were buying aluminum tubes and therefore somehow that means nuclear weapons like nobody bought that shit except evidently literally everyone at the new york times well, what about the <laughs> well, speaking of aluminum tools, uh, t aluminum tubes, um, aluminum tubes, and the mobile weapon labs ep evidence? Oh yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Colin Powell comes into the UN Security Council with a gr a drawing, a graphic <laughs> as a computer graphic. Um, Somebody sketched it out on their. Someone like, sketches piece of out paper. on. on <laughs> no, no. A no. Someone is yeah. a made this. On Photoshop, <laughs> on on MS Paint, on, on MS, MS Paint, Paint. <laughs> um, yeah, mobile weapons labs. <laughs> this is the evidence. Like Saddam has mobile weapons labs. Look, I have a drawing. <laughs> what if I just came in with like a picture of like a bunch of dots, unclear dots, and I was like, "Hey, um, uh, this person has herpes." But <laughs> <I> evidence, <was> like. <laughs> Um, but just the, yeah, the reason why you had to use fucking pictures is because you had zero evidence right. and it was an entire charade and it was a right. performance art. Powell, Colin Powell said that was the most shameful moment of his entire life. 
Mm-hmm. So, I mean, he knew very well that he was lying about that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, she also, Judith Miller also reported that the U.S. found mobile weapons after the after the war started. Um, just, just, a, just deceptions, just complete deceptions. And um, the nuclear weapon thing is that the trick that media played with all this was that um, so a speechwriter named Michael Gerson suggested that they use the word smoking gun and mushroom cloud mm-hmm. together in every sentence. So whenever someone went to go speak with the press, you would say smoking gun, mushroom cloud. For, so, for example, we don't want the smoking gun to be a mushroom cloud. That was like a common, um, that was a common, like some common rhetoric. Yeah, that was the line. That was the that line. That was the line. That, that was, was the talking, talking point. point. Mm-hmm. We don't want the smoking gun to be a mushroom cloud. Um, another one was mentioning Al Qaeda and, and Saddam Hussein every chance you get. So to say Al Qaeda and, and Saddam Hussein in, in a sentence together. Even though they're not related to one another, but you just make that mental relationship. Even though that they hate each other. Right. Even though that there is no Al Qaeda in Iraq with Saddam Hussein in charge, as as putrid and as terrible of a person as Saddam Hussein was, as awful as Saddam Hussein as bad as he was, uh, like he did not let fucking the claims do were shit. not yeah. true. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Jesus. The the most um, I think the. The biggest deception was the Niger forgeries. Mm-hmm. So, the most compelling accusation was that Iraq secretly tried to purchase 500 tons of yellow cake uranium from Niger mm-hmm. to refine and produce nuclear weapons. Right. It was compelling because Iraq only had you know, one real plausible use for uranium. Right. And also, Niger wasn't a part of um, the IAEA, you know. And they don't have to, they don't have to report their sales and and where they go to, and stuff like that. So, because that had happened in, in the past. I mean, like Iraq had been purchasing, you know, uranium from a number of uh, uh, different people over the years, including during the Iran Iraq War. Um, they had purchased it from Portugal. They had purchased it from Italy. They had purchased it from Brazil, uh, Niger, uh, definitely, um, but. I guess, you know, it was a plausible lie, as you said, because what else is he going to use yellow cake uranium for? And also, he had per- he had made that purchase before. Well, the documents that they were using in this case were completely false. Right. So, right. so the documents that proved that Saddam Hussein, like the receipt, was, was, was forged. It was a forgery. And the White House used this faulty intelligence and refused to share these documents with the IAEA until two weeks from the war. When the IAEA got the, the, these documents, they figured out these were forged within a couple of hours. The IAEA. Like, okay, these mm-hmm. are they, these were these were these were forgeries. So two weeks before the invasion, um, the Director General of the, the Atomic Energy Agency, they testified before the UN that this Niger dossier that is, that is based on is, is completely based off forged documents mm-hmm. and the and they, they were just disregarded there was like oh yeah that's not true <laughs> now they're real <laughs> okay and again this is the like this is kind of important because the IAEA you know, is like the, they are the organization that's supposed to like verify the 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 creation and the uh, sale uh, and the enrichment of fissile material pretty much across the entire planet. And they're saying that this is not right. And they're like, no, yes, it is. You're fake news. Yeah, this 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 is fake news. Um, shit, we are at. An hour. We're almost at two hours, man, and okay. we haven't even touched on just. We haven't even touched on all the the lies about the Iraq War. 
but I don't think it's possible to do it in a single episode because there are just so many. Hopefully they, that, that wet your whistle, you know? Yeah. Hopefully that wet your whistle. Um, all right, so should we wrap this one up? Yeah, I think so. Uh, if you're super interested in it, in the topic, and you want us to follow up on it, like we're happy to, um, let us know. Hit us up. And uh, for you folks listening on YouTube, hopefully this audio sounded a bit better for you, a little louder. And we appreciate the feedback, so keep giving it to us so that we can keep making the changes to make the, the podcast and the live stream better for you. Yes. Um, let us know if there's any technical issues and if you're listening on if you're uh, yeah subscribe to the channel if you're listening on YouTube if you're listening on audio uh, make sure that you rate and review the podcast it is the number one way to help us grow the show Uh, give us a five star rating and a review and um, yeah we are going we are planning on interesting uh, interesting we're planning on releasing a lot more interesting content um, we will keep you in the loop about some of the stuff that we're working on. But um, I guess uh, until uh, next week, do you have anything to say? Uh, I do. Uh, you might notice that we're recording today on a Wednesday and not a Thursday. So if something ridiculous happens on a Thursday and we don't talk about it for the Friday, that that's why. <laughs> so hopefully nothing crazy happens. Yeah, um, hopefully nothing too uh, nuts happens. All right, peace, guys. See ya.